Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today, I'm going to talk about discernment, and not in a way that people commonly regard the term discernment. Oh, Bartley or anyone is talking about discernment again. I'm going to talk about discernment as a lead-in to talking about self-delusion, deception, and a number of other issues that I see plaguing uh, the UFO field, the esoteric field today. I had a very good pre-recorded interview with Jerry Marzinski. Jerry will be talking about, in this upcoming interview, case studies of examples where entity-infested people <laughs> did all kinds of things at the behest of these entities. I'm talking about the entities behind the dark intrusive thoughts uh, some of the stories he's shared in the past on the show, and some he hasn't. Uh, but the good thing about it is these stories are now concentrated in a, in a two-hour interview. And Jerry made the point, and very similar to a point Barbara Bartholik made once. Jerry made the point that we are all subject to these intrusive thoughts, whether we realize it or not. And it's absolutely true. And Barbara Bartholick said something very similar, too, years ago. She said, even if someone doesn't believe in aliens, even if someone is a researcher, knows aliens exist, but feels they've never had alien encounters, they are still being malignly influenced by negative aliens. In short, everyone is being malignly influenced by negative aliens and also by these uh, dark entities behind the intrusive thoughts and all one needs to do is look around at this 4D reality around us uh, if, if you have any doubts about that listening to Jerry I was struck by the fact that so many people the gossips, the pathological liars the narcissist they, stri they strike me as people who have these entities working through them, these entities that have comfortably merged with the host vessel, if you will. Uh, we, Jerry and I talked about the spirit of accusation. It, it, that's a term that was used going way back, at least to the Middle Ages, to describe people who were constantly going around accusing others of uh, misdeeds, uh, accusing others of wrongdoing. If you saw the movie The Scarlet Letter, I think it was with... Uh, Winona Ryder, it was a take on the Salem witch hunts, and the Winona Ryder character played one of these women who was accusing everyone of, else of being a witch, uh, the spirit of accusation. And we see that with gossips, incorrigible gossips. It's often been said that you know, be wary of gossips because when they're around you, they're constantly talking about everyone else. And then when they're not around you, they're talking about you. And that's absolutely true. That's that's what happens. What we're seeing in actual fact is these entities working through these people, uh, spreading accusations, spreading gossip. It's an example where these intrusive, intrusive thoughts have become the norm and these people verbalize these thoughts uh, Jerry talked about how one of the things the entities did the entities behind the dark intrusive thoughts they would strive to isolate the individual that they're manipulating uh, because the person hears these thoughts in their own thought voice they think the, these are their own thoughts but they're not and these thoughts are telling them Oh, this person, that person, your mother, your father, your partner, your your wife, they're bad. They're saying things behind your back. They're doing things uh, against you. They're striving to isolate the person, to make the person detach from their support system, to make it easier for these intrusive thoughts and the negative entities behind them to continually work on that individual, isolate them from their support structure, and then really hammer them with even more dark intrusive thoughts, leading up to uh, dark thoughts about inflicting harm on others or inflicting harm on themselves. 
Now, the point of relevance here is these people with these entities working through them, and they verbalize these thoughts rather than just keep these thoughts to themselves. And the gossips and the rumor mongers and the, the, those afflicted with the spirit of accusation, all they're doing is being a vehicle, a medium through which these entities can cause problems in interpersonal relationships. And I've been on the receiving end of these uh, gossip mongers, these people afflicted with the spirit of accusation, these pathological liars. And these people would never dream in a million years that it is actual entities working through them. They're merely verbalizing the thoughts input, inputted into their minds in their own thought voice by these entities. And insert your name here. Uh, James is doing this. James is doing that. Sally is doing this. Sally is doing that. Uh, James is this. James is that. Sally is this. Sally is that. Just lying, 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 lying. But they're merely verbalizing the intrusive thoughts they're hearing in their heads. You see how that works, right? To create strife, acrimony, discord. That's their stock and trade. And when I think of these rumor mongers, these people afflicted with the spirit of accusation, I, and I think of what they look like, I, almost all of them, are full-on reptilian hybrids, raging reptilian hybrids. Uh, the drooping hooded eyelids, the eye sunk deep in the eye sockets, the prominent cheekbones. I mean, these are full-on raging reptile hybrids. So it's no wonder, no surprise that some of them are going around, you know, these gossip mongers, rumor mongers, afflicted with the spirit of accusation verbalizing all these dark thoughts put into their heads by entities working through them, and they're not even aware of it in most cases. That's just, from the entity influence perspective, that's the beauty of it all. So keep that point in mind when I'm talking about discernment, when I'm talking about delusion and deception and self-delusion. It all ties in. As I see it, is the, the lack of life experience that many people in this field or want to be in this field have. They have traveled, some of them, all over the world. They've had interesting occupations. They've uh, attended university, etc., etc. But in the overall scheme of things, they lack uh, worldly experience. Oh, wait a minute, Bartley. I've went to way more countries than you have. You've only went to X, Y, and Z countries in your travels. I've been to 97 different countries. Yes, but what did they do in those countries? Did they study the history of those countries and the peoples and the cultures before they went? Did they mix with the locals and did they go to the places where the locals hang out, where the locals eat, where the locals dine, where the locals party? Or did they just spend their time in resorts? Oh, no, 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 I didn't do that. I, I, I took hiking tours. and Yeah, but did you take hiking tours with tour guides? And uh, did you go off the beaten track? Did you go where, you know, typical tourists don't go? Or did you just go from one resort to another and you took these uh, well-known tour guide trips, heavily supervised? Because in the overall scheme, scheme of things, folks, that's not much life experience. Sure, they'll bring back a lot of memories, Kodak moments, they used to call them. And some of these people find themselves having certain experiences or develop an interest in the things that we're interested in. And then they dive in at the deep end and think they have enough worldly life experience to navigate their way through all the deception and through all the manipulation. And in many cases, they don't. Like, again, I, I said, I quoted from Sun Tzu, all warfare is based on deception. What is Mossad's motto? By deception thou shalt wage war. What did General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson say? He said, always mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy. 
if possible, and when you strike and overcome him, never let up in the pursuit so long as your men have strength to follow. Uh, but the first part of that quote is key. Always mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy. And so many of these people go into this field with rose-colored glasses, uh, blinders on. And the fact of the matter is, and it needs to be brought out, so many of these people that are seeking answers, it's the nature of this 4D matrix we're in. Many of them are unhealed. Many of them are damaged. Many of them are wounded at a deep soul level, not just in this life, but in other lives too. And it's a cumulative effect, folks. And they go seeking answers, and when they come across these silver-tongued, smooth-talking people that seem to know what they're about, they make the cardinal mistake of equating apparent friendliness, pleasantness, and amiability with truthfulness, sincerity, pure motivations. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've met more shysters and more frauds and more backstabbers and more pathological liars, more kleptomaniacs in the UFO, conspiracy, esoteric field than in any other walk of life, any other facet of life. I've met so many frauds and shysters in this field, it's not even funny. They're everywhere. So we must get past this notion of, well, he sounds really nice, she sounds really nice, uh... I relate to ooh, 12% of what they're saying and the other 90% or whatever percent I really can't make heads or tails of because they tend to speak in metaphysical riddles, because they, they tend to uh, speak in esoteric jargon. They, can, they tend to contradict themselves. They tend to reel out uh, big whoppers, lies, left, right, and center. And because these people are shame-based, because they're wounded, because they're unhealed, because they haven't learned how to say no. They just take things on face value. Okay, I don't understand all this other stuff, but this little bit that I can relate to, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. And by extension, they, they buy into that one part that has resonance, meaning to them, and they don't realize it, but they're taking everything else on board energetically as well, spiritually, all the black magic, all the high tech, all the uh, entrainment, everything that goes with it. Because they lack the self-worth to say, no, this guy's full of it. This gal is full of it. I just caught him right there saying something idiotic, a blatant lie. Uh, I want to hear nothing more from this person. But they don't have discernment. One has to get to that point where we're so comfortable in our own skins, so comfortable in our own energetic field, that when we sense the slightest discordance, when we sense anything in our heart center that says, ah, this guy, no, he's giving off a bad, bad vibe. Uh, I'm not buying into it. I'm turning this off. I'm uh, focusing my attention elsewhere. People need to get to that level of discernment where they don't have to go through hours and hours and days and weeks worth of uh, video watching, podcast listening, lecture attendance over and over and over because they lack the self-worth to just say, nope, that's nonsense. See, when I'm reading a book, and say I'm reading a book, mainstream military history, say World War II history, I'm reading it for my own purposes because I'm interested in the strategies, logistics, intelligence, etc., etc. When they slip something in, they being the writers, the authors, that I know is blatantly false or wrong or just BS, I, I call them out on it. I call them out on it. I say it to myself. I say out loud, no, that's wrong. That's BS. And then I move on. I turn the page. And then I literally, then I just keep reading. Because I'm not reading some books for a, a greater awareness, understanding of how to defeat this 4D prison matrix. I'm reading it. In a way, I am. I'm reading it to get a better sense of the past, history, mainstream history, military history, logistics, intelligence, etc., etc. But when I see something that I know is blatantly false, 
oh, the Pearl Harbor attack caught the Americans by a complete surprise, and no one in the higher ranks was expecting it. Complete nonsense, right? And, and I'll just make a note of it. Okay, that's nonsense, and move on. And I can do it, folks, without a guilty thought. I can do it without saying, well, you know, by putting this thought out into the ether, I hope I don't hurt the feelings of this author if, you know, one night he sits up in bed and, oh, someone out there, you know, just disbelieved the sentence in my book and, and my feelings are hurt and I'm not getting my emotional needs met. I don't care about any of that. It, it's a self-check kind of system I have within me. When I'm reading, 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 okay, that's BS, but, uh, you know, discard. I'm not reading it for an understanding of the surface level or deeper 4D matrix problem that we're in. I'm reading it for other purposes that help give me some background, right? And people need to get to that point in their heart where they can just instantly identify BS and just discard it. And I've made the mistake in the recent past when I know people were completely full of it. You know, and I felt that, okay, if I'm just pleasant and they're pleasant and I'm friendly and they're friendly, and we can agree to disagree and and then move on and, you know, be cordial to one another at the conferences and et cetera, et cetera. But no, it, it doesn't turn out like that. Because with entity influence the way it is, these people that you meet halfway and you're friendly to and cordial to, they're working off a different sheet of paper. Their egos are activated. They have entities working through them, baby. Multiple entities at times. And they're so ego-driven, they, they think that you're a fool and that you won't catch on to the nature of their BS. Right? And when you call them out in their BS, they get all hurt and offended. And, oh, I got all emotional uh, because Bartley just doesn't believe my BS anymore. Well, I never believe in the first place. But I have no qualms about being cordial with people. You see the same things in the embassies all the time. And, you know, the events and the cocktail drinking. I mean, there's spies in the mix all over the place. And they're just being pleasant and friendly to each other. But... Really, they're just trying to pick each other's brains and try not to give away too much information. They're playing the game. I understand that. But a lot of people don't. They mistake apparent the facade of friendliness, of amiability with sincerity. And that's where discernment, energetic discernment comes in, where you you. you just bypass completely all the rubbish, all the drivel, all the lies spewing out of their mouths. Tune into the frequency and say, nope, I got a bad vibe in my heart center. I want no part of this person. And that's key. And that we only get to that state if we're comfortable in our own skin and if we believe in ourselves and we're not always looking for others to complete us, that we're not needy, that we're not codependent. There was a time, I don't know about now, but back in in the formation of Delta Force, which was modeled consciously on the British SAS, that when someone rocked up, you know, uh, a volunteer or recruited from one of the other branches of the service, or one of the other units in the army, for example, from the Rangers, whatever, and they they would ask these people, these applicants, well, why do you want to join Delta Force? And if they said something like, well, I want to prove myself, I can prove I can do all these things, they would point to the door, get out of here. They weren't looking for people who were constantly trying to prove themselves to uh, constantly trying to figure themselves out. They wanted people who knew what they were about, who don't need to prove to themselves anything. That's where we need to be, quite frankly, where we can just say, no, BS, and Say it to yourself, say it out loud even, and not feel guilty about it and shame-based and hope you're not hurting someone else's feelings. I'm going to talk right now about a big whopper because somebody, uh, I mentioned briefly in my previous commentary about how this one silver-tongued deceiver out there, astral raptoid, spun this whopper of a tale about how his, his mother was given full unfettered access to all these NSA reports about crash flying saucers way back in the day. And then someone wrote to me and said, well, how do you know that didn't really happen? So I'm going to dispel some of the fallacies and some of the outrageous absurdities that have become the norm in, in our field. 
And this is a big part of the problem, is these perps, these deceivers out there, they have a target audience. They know who they want to manipulate. And this particular individual with the me mum brought home NSA documents about flying saucers, he has a particular specific target audience. Quite frankly, mostly women. And it used to be back in the day, and I've been around long enough, that a lot of the women in the UFO field, they were quite aware of how black ops, how intelligence work worked. Nowadays, everyone tries to get a pedigree. Oh, yes, you know, my father, my grandfather uh, w was in intelligence, was in the military, or this particular NSA Whopper guy. Yeah, me mom was, uh, you know, satanic family. Me dad was a satanic family. Uh, Freemasons on both sides and high level this, high level. They're trying to gain, trying to gain the moral ascendancy over you. I have pedigree. I was born into this. I'm bloodline. I know things. I'm feeling self-important because I know things. Because I have sh secrets, right? And some people in intelligence, real intelligence, are like that. They feel self-important because they're keeping secrets. And one of these guys in the recent past, one of these esoteric messiahs, he tried to imply that, oh yeah, his, his uncle was a foreign national back in the day, decades ago, rocks up to Dayton, Ohio, and somehow gets accepted into the secret UFO program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, right? This is another absurdity. Just someone's going to rock up and say, okay, come on in. Here's the alien bodies, right? Here's the alien technology. Tell, tell us, Mr. Wizard, what you can make out of it. Now another guy's popped up in the scene saying that he's uh, autopsied 3,000 alien bodies uh, in a relatively short career. This guy doesn't even look like he's 40 years old. Do you have any idea how large a number 3,000 is? And also, 3,000 alien bodies on top of that? How long it takes to do a proper autopsy? What, what did this guy stumble upon a battlefield and find 3,000 dead aliens? And Oh, you're the only guy that has a medical background. Do autopsies on all of them. Is that how it worked? Or is he implying that his, his access, his clearance level was such that anywhere in the world there was a dead alien that would fly him in or, or have him step through a, uh, a, a teleporter and beam him over there instantly just so he can work on alien bodies? This is, this is an absurdity. And because these unhealed people don't have a conceptual framework, they are lacking in life experience, you see, Greg Braden is right. The divine matrix talks back to you because I have an interest in all these things. Over the years, I've spoken to many, many people in all walks of life in the military, intelligence, aerospace community. The divine matrix will serve these people up almost like in a silver platter. And then if you know what questions to ask, if you have the background and you don't scare them off by acting like you know too much, you can learn quite a bit from some of these people and then you can use that to augment what you already know from your own your own private studies but a lot of these people out there they don't have that background and and what also happens it's important to understand as far as this nsa whopper guy is concerned this tall teller of tall tales is the people that fall for all that because they're unhealed because they're wounded and because they're at, at, at the core level shame-based and frightened and still carrying the trauma, the energetic blocked negative energy, traumatic energy within them, what happens also is they are willing to uh, momentarily or for a, uh, prolonged periods suspend their disbelief. It's like when you go to a James Bond movie and, and you see the James Bond character, Roger Moore, whoever it was, right? Pierce Brosnan, they're doing all these things, come out of it without a scratch, millions of people shooting at them, always seem to get away with it. And when you're watching this, you just suspend your disbelief. It's a movie. You know it's fake, but you, you go along with the, the fantasy of it. And then at the end of the movie, you know, if you have any self-worth, you'll know that a lot of that was nonsense. Irony, because... Uh, Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond books, he was he was a player. He was the one that helped form 30 Assault Unit, made up of Royal Marine Commandos, engineers, technicians that went around, you know, ahead of a lot of the other elite troops to get to 
German intelligence headquarters and make off with all their documents and make off with all their technology, right? Uh, and he was involved in all kinds of black ops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he knew how the game was played. But novels and and movies being what they are, you know, they they tend to take on this fantastical aspect to them. And you suspend your disbelief. The problem with these unhealed people, when they go to these gurus, when they go to these smooth-talking, silver-tongued frauds, they don't suspend their disbelief. They take everything on board. And also, some of the esoteric frauds, there's a mesmerizing aspect to them. The longer they talk, especially in a private session, in a Skype session, and even in a larger context, like people viewing uh, a an interview or they're giving a lecture somewhere. If people don't have proper energetic shields and if they don't have this framework of understanding, it's very easy for them to be put into a fugue state and or, or put into a state where they they get entrained, they're thinking their their, their brainwave patterns and they take on all the stuff on board energetically as well. So there's that black magic, if you will, manipulation hoochie element to it, okay? So I just want to say that, lay, lay that out the groundwork, and then let me let me explain now why this whole NSA, me mum brought home documents of fl crash flying saucers is utter nonsense. Okay, Dr. Robert Sarbarker, you heard me talk about him before, but it bears repeating. When he gave information in a private meeting with Dr. Wilbert Smith of Canada, he said that this is in 1950. Dr. Robert Sarbarker at the time was an unpaid consultant with the Pentagon who had access to crash saucer information, uh, recovered alien technology, alien bodies, etc. He told Wilbert Smith, the subject of UFOs, aliens, flying saucers, is the most highly classified at that time, 1950, in the U.S., and by extension, the whole world. He said that on top of that, the subject is rated two points higher in classification and secrecy than even the hydrogen bomb. Okay? That's 1950. Now, let's backtrack. Let's look at the compartmentalization and the, the lengths and, and the extreme measures that were taken to ensure the secrecy within the Manhattan Project and other projects during World War II. Jean Tatlock was the uh, paramour, the mistress of Robert Oppenheimer. Later on, he said that Jean Tatlock was the one that got him into communism, got him into all these left-wing causes in the 1930s, maybe even earlier, etc., etc. And even when Oppenheimer was already the director of at Los Alamos, he was still seeing Gene Tatlock on the side. In fact, he'd, he'd come up with this scheme to go to the San Francisco Bay Area, ostensibly to recruit one of his foreign, former students, uh, either at, from Berkeley or Caltech, because he taught at both, and he recruited from both. That was the ostensible purpose of his going back to the Bay Area, was to look up one of his for, for, former students and bring him into the program. Well, he may have done that, but he was really there to see Gene Tatlock, and he spent the night with her. The agents of Army Counterintelligence, uh, G2, and within G2 is counterintelligence in the Army, they followed Oppenheimer. In fact, they watched him go into the, the home of Gene Tatlock where he spent the night. Now, Oppenheimer was already married to Kitty Oppenheimer at the time. And it was decided at that point, the person whose army intelligence agents were watching Oppenheimer, other than Boris Lash. Boris Lash later, towards the tail end of World War II, he was a colonel of memory serves. He headed up the Alsos mission, where he led a team to go even ahead of the, of the front lines, to get to suspected German atomic weapons research facilities, find out what the Germans knew, how far they progressed, bring back any intelligence that was worthwhile to prove conclusively to themselves that the Germans had or had not an atomic weapons program. It's still later, Boris Lash wound up being implicated in the 
assassination of Jack Kennedy because Boris Lash later became part of the CIA's AM Lash program, assassinations, wet missions, etc., etc. Well, going back to Gene Tatlock, Boris Pash's agents were, Army intelligence agents were watching Gene Tatlock, had her under surveillance. Here comes Oppenheimer, the head of uh, of the director, uh, he's the director of Los Alamos Project. They spend the night with each other. And sooner or later, Gene Tatlock commits suicide, right? No, she was suicided. Why? Because she was deemed a threat to the project. They don't want Robert Oppenheimer to have his mind clouded with like issues of, oh, should I stick with my mistress, who's a known communist and has communist connections? Should I carry on this illicit affair with Gene Tatlock uh, behind my wife's back and somehow uh, do this without Army intelligence and the FBI knowing? No, they decided to cut their losses and they suicided Gene Tatlock. They gave her some barbiturate, uh, they gave her a Mickey Finn uh, to, to knock her out and then they drowned her in her, in her own bathtub, wrote a suicide note and to this day, establishment historians say, oh, she was in a state of depression. She committed suicide. Nonsense. They suicided her. Okay? That's what I mean by extreme secrecy, compartmentalization. And I think also of the women who served in uh, Dayton, Ohio, in uh, right, near Wright Field, but later became Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I think it may have been an annex to Wright Field. This is a... 42, 43 time frame. Actually, maybe even earlier than that. Uh, once the U.S. got fully involved, they were already in a shooting war with the German Navy and German U-boats in, in the Atlantic prior to Pearl Harbor. Not many people realize that. But certainly after Pearl Harbor, uh, and the, the Germans stupidly declared war on, on the U.S., well... What the Americans said to the British were, okay, our shipping losses are unacceptable, and we're not going to wait for you British, you stodgy, old, uh, tired, uh, class-ridden British, to give us intelligence about the location of the German U-boats through your decryption of uh, German U-boat signals using what was known as the Bomba. The Bomba were these large machines developed first by the Poles to help decrypt German signals intelligence, what became known as Ultra. But in this case, it was the Ultra directed towards decrypting the signals to the German, from the German U-boat headquarters to the U-boats at sea. And the Americans were not happy with the sharing procedure. They felt they were not getting enough intel from the British, who were very security-minded in their own right. So what the Americans did was they created a whole bunch of their own Bomba machines. And they put them in a secret building in Dayton, Ohio. And they had these uh, women... Uh, basically drafted uh, into uh, the armed service, I think it was the Navy, yeah, where they oversaw the running of all these bomber machines so they could determine, crack the uh, German ciphers intended for the German U-boats so they can reroute their convoys so they won't get sunk. When these women were first inducted into that program, they were told in no uncertain terms, if you tell anybody about what you're doing here, we will kill you. We will kill you. And look at the contents, the context. There was all kinds of American merchant vessels that were supplying both the, uh, the British and, and the Russians, the Soviets, and uh, there was Operation Bolero. They're building up the uh, the American troops, American supplies in England to use it as a huge base. And these ships were being sunk left, right, and center. 
Operation Drumbeat was the code name that the German U-boat fleet had for attacking, especially off the American eastern seaboard, American shipping. So they didn't play any games, okay? Now, this gets me closer and closer to what I'm talking about, about the, the bogus NSA story. First of all, the reason this Messiah used the term NSA, it's a buzzword. Ooh, he's talking about the NSA. I've got chills running down my spine. His, his mom had NSA documents. It's Ooh, that's so chic and trendy. But what is the NSA? It's, it's the electronic eavesdropping empire where they intercept... All kinds of communications, telephone, telegraph, uh, telegram in the old days, nowadays increasingly emails, everything else. And the original particular emphasis of NSA and its subordinate formations, it only coalesced into the NSA in the early 1950s, if memory serves, was to ensure the security of, of the U.S. communications, but also to decrypt the communications of other nations okay that's what NSA and its subordinate organs are all, really all about ensuring their own communications security but also deciphering cracking reading the communications of other countries of other intelligence agencies increasingly of corporations nowadays right and I talked earlier about how Sar Barker talked about how the subject of UFOs was rated two points higher than even the... See, the NSA would have a subordinate role in all this UFO stuff. They would not have the primary military role that, say, naval intelligence would have, or first the Atomic Energy Commission later turns into the Department of Energy. Remember, the Dulce facility and others like it were run by the Department of Energy, DOE. And we must understand also the special relationship between the British and the Americans and how it was thoroughly jeopardized and hanging in tatters and almost came to an end because of a number of spy scandals, British spy scandals. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Right after World War II, the Americans instituted what was known as the McMahon Act, the McMahon Act, basically forbidding the British from any atomic weapons research intelligence information this put the British in a quandary, right? They wanted to share in the spoils. The British, Churchill had actually talked Roosevelt into allowing a, a contingent of British uh, physicists and engineers into the Manhattan Project. Now, because of the decryption of Soviet telegrams issued by Moscow Center to their worldwide spying apparatus, the KGB and the GRU, First, the GRU was the, the primary Soviet military intelligence, was chiefly tasked with one of their main tasks, was penetrating their code name for the Manhattan Project, which was enormous. was first a GRU program, and then, because it became politicized a subject, Stalin gave the job to the KGB, known as the NKVD back then, and there's a relevance behind all this. The Americans became aware of the espionage efforts of the Soviets into the Manhattan Project because there was a top secret program known as Venona where they were decrypting the the coded and ciphered telegrams issued by Moscow Center. You see the U.S. government had a deal long before Snowden talked about this going way back to the beginning because the U.S. government had worked out a deal with corporations uh, communications corporations, telegram corporations, IT&T, ATT, etc., etc., uh, the Bell companies, pass on all telegrams and all forms of communica- communication in and out of the U.S. Uh, destined for foreign countries. So as a matter of course, the U.S. Uh, telegraph companies routinely gave over to the U.S. government all these enciphered telegrams that was received from Moscow Center abroad intended for all the different Soviet so-called residentures, so-called, uh, these are embassies, out of which locally, all the various embassies and consulates and trade missions 
that the Soviets ran their spy operations out of. So these are just enciphered telegrams. They don't really mean anything if you don't know what the, the, if you can't break the cipher. So what the Americans did, starting in 1944, even before World War II was over, they put together a special team which was coming out of Moscow Center, directions to all the embassies out of which the GRU and the NKVD slash KGB were running their spying operations, not only in the U.S., but in Canada, Australia, all over the Western world. This program was known as Venona, and they only partially decrypted or completely decrypted a small fraction of the overall number of telegrams issued by Moscow Center. But still, it was enough working with the FBI also, it was still enough for them to get an idea of the vastness of the efforts of the GRU and later the NKVD to penetrate the Manhattan Project. And they found out that there were already a number of serving spies that were already burrowed away like moles deep inside the Manhattan Project. Okay. And then in 1945, shortly after the war, Igor Gazenko, who was a GRU cipher clerk in the uh, Soviet embassy in Ottawa, if memory serves, Ottawa, Canada, Canada, he defects. He brings a whole treasure trove of, of secret documents, uh, uh, communications, cipher information. At first, the, the Canadians knocked him back. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Mackenzie King wanted nothing to do with him, but eventually, you know, right before the KGB closed in on Igor Gazenko, he was finally given refuge by the Canadians, and then they debriefed him, and out of him came all this information about a vast Soviet spy network in Canada that was penetrating the Manhattan Project, because Canadians had their own aspect of the Manhattan Project, the Chalk River mission, where they were working on uh, reactors. And Alan Nunn May, a communist scientist, was working in the Chalk River program for the Canadians, that part of the Manhattan Project. Well, combined with what was coming out of Venona, combined with what Igor Gazenko was saying, it became obvious that there was a large Soviet spy ring operating within the Manhattan Project. And then in 1950 comes the arrest of Claus Fuchs. Claus Fuchs was again part of the British mission in the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And Tube Alloys, it was called Tube Alloys in, in, in England, the, the code name for the uh, nuclear weapons. They called it Atomic back then, the Atomic Weapons Program. He provided the calculations with, which with Rudolf Perls used to submit to the MOD committee to convince the uh, MOD committee that a nuclear weapon, an atomic weapon, was feasible. He was a mathematician by trade. He was a long-term communist going back to his days as a communist agitator. In the 1920s and 1930s in Germany, there must have been, it's speculated there was probably moles within MI5 which deliberately overlooked his communist past in Germany and allowed him into what became known as tube alloys, the, the British code name for their own new atomic weapons program, which actually was in existence before the Manhattan Project. So Klaus Fuchs was exposed and he was arrested. He was a very well-placed spy. Uh, as a matter of fact, at one time, he was personally handled by Ursula Kaczynski, one of the most important uh, spies uh, in, in annals of espionage. And then in 1951, May 1951, came the defections of Guy Burgess, longtime MI6 officer, foreign service officer, uh, formerly with Special Operations Executive during World War II, and also Thomas McLean, who was the first secretary in Cairo uh, in the foreign office, a very important uh, uh, job. He was also part of the Combined Policy Committee in Washington, D.C., when he was posted in Washington, D.C., the Combined Policy Committee, I think that was the name of it, determined the allocation of uranium and uranium-235 and determining the allocation of uranium and uranium-235, you can work out just how many atomic weapons can be developed over time. 
and Thomas McLean had access. In fact, he had a pass issued by the Atomic Energy Commission where he can go to just about any any Atomic Energy Commission facility unsupervised, okay? And they both defected because the ring was closing around McLean. In fact, the intelligence that finally fingered Thomas McLean in his time as, in Washington, D.C. as a spy came from the Venona decrypts that I talked about earlier, okay? And then the McMahon Act forbidding the, the British from receiving atomic weapons information, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. the defections of Burgess and McLean from the Venona decrypts as well as from Igor Gazenko's revelations, the, the GRU cipher clerk who defected from Canada, they determined that Alan Nunn may a scientist, a British scientist with a background from Cambridge, like a lot of these, the Cambridge-Oxbridge uh, connection from uh, the UK. He was a communist spy. In fact, Alan Nunn May provided a small sample of weapons-grade uranium-235 to his Soviet handler. And it was through Igor Gizenko, it was through Venona, that they determined that Alan Nunn May was a spy for the Soviets. So you can see why... At that point, 1945, going forward, the, the Philby uh, Burgess uh, defections in May 1951, uh, the defection of Bruno Pontecorvo, another atomic scientist, he defected, he was a communist, came in through the British again. You can see why the Americans no longer wanted to give the, the British any access to atomic weapons secrets. Okay, Atomic Energy Commission later morphed into the Department of Energy. And the McMahon Act forbidding the, the British from any information of an atomic weapons nature. This led directly to the British forming their own atomic bomb project, which led to the, the test firing of atomic bombs in, in Montebello Island. Maralinga became a nuclear weapons testing center. Emu Field became in Australia became a nuclear testing center. Okay, cause and effect. The Americans deprived of, of atomic weapons information, so they started their own wep weapons program, and the people of Australia, the Aborigines, and the um, uh, Australian servicemen, etc., etc., they paid the price for it. And out of all that, we're supposed to believe, at a time when the special relationship between the CIA and MI6 in particular, and MI5 and the FBI in particular, were in tatters, at a time when the, the British were not even allowed atomic energy information. And remember, the subject of UFOs, flying saucers, is two points higher than the atomic weapons information, the nuclear weapons information, later the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb information. We're supposed to believe that a foreign national, uh, this guy's mother, all kinds of NSA documents, and remember, the NSA's job is... is um, decryption and analysis of foreign communications okay they're not even one of the main players in as far as i know about the ufo program it, the nsa term is sexy oh it's trendy nsa nsa right when actually it's it was naval intelligence and it was the department of energy before that the atomic energy commission that were the main players and then, and then after that the the aerospace corporations began to take more and more control of the project but we're just supposed to believe that a drunken alcoholic woman British national can bring home NSA documents about flying saucers from crash saucers from all over the world leave these documents on her dinner table where the young boy can like read them ooh this is interesting when, when any two bit burglar can gain access to those documents Never mind black bag operatives from the GRU or the KGB can s slip into that woman's house and make off with these NSA documents. I I'm supposed to believe all this? To hear the tale in its entirety, it sounds like a very poorly written grade B movie. Okay, once again, the pedigree kicks in. Uh, his grandfather was this highfalutin, high-level Satanist who decreed that his daughter, who was not a Satanist but only a white witch, because his daughter had uh, German language skills, uh, the NSA needed her to translate these documents from German 
to English. And she was taken on board MI5 as a result. And MI5 loaned her out to the NSA. As if, as if NSA doesn't have their own German translators. How many people realize that at one time, the NSA actually had a whole room full of blind people? Why? Because their hearing was so acute. When they put the headphones on, they can hear these faint signals. Tap, 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 Morse code, right? Now, if they're going to go to the trouble of having a room full, dozens, if not hundreds, of these blind people who, whose hearing is so acute, they can hear these very, very faint signals, no matter how much they're amplified, but they can't find like a qualified German translator to read these documents uh, that the Germans uh, had come up with about crash flying saucers in German-controlled territory in World War II. This is, I don't even know where to go with that. And then the tales only get bigger and bigger after that. Oh, his grandfather is Anu, the white Draco. Uh, he had a torrid love affair with the queen of the female lion beings. He, he, he wasn't just, um, in his previous incarnation, one of them, he was the original Adamu, the original Adam that was created in the, uh, the Anunnaki genetics labs. And no one just calls him out on this nonsense. And when someone calls him out on this BS, hey, you showed up in my dream last night, you were doing this astral hoochie on me, you were trying to astrally rape me, he goes livid, he goes into a mouth-forming rage, and he starts to threaten to sue these people. Oh, how very ADL of him. How very anti-defamation league. Uh, this guy who's supposed to be anti-establishment for the people. The moment people call him out on his BS, the moment people point out, hey, you're an astral operator, you're showing up in my, my dreams, he blows his top when he threatens to sue him. And now he's playing the victim again. I always talk about the victim-aggressor mentality, folks. And now he's saying, oh, some, one of his former clients is doing this astral hoochie black magic on him. I'm a victim of a victim. When he's always the ones threatening people, threatening to sue them, because when they call him out for his BS... He blows his top, and he goes from the you know soft-spoken, mild-mannered, uh, I'm anti-establishment, I'm the most surveilled, monitored person in the world. Uh, my grandfather was a Satanist, and he got my mom into the program, and she was the only available German translator. So you know the NSA entrusted her with documents, and and then when someone calls him out on his BS, he flo he blows his top, goes into a mouth-bombing rage, and threatens to sue them. How, how ADL of him, okay? How ADL of him? And and it's because of the lack of life experience that so many of these people have that go to this guy for consults, that listen to this guy, that believe this guy. It's because of their lack of life experience and their, the fact that they're unhealed, the fact that they're, they're wounded inside and they want to believe and they want to suspend their disbelief and they want to get vicariously live through this guy's fantasies that they go along with it. They, they don't call him out in the BS that it is. Right? And this is why all these wild things about nuclear weapons don't exist. Do you have any idea how many nuclear engineers, Navy nuclear engineers, have passed through Navy nuclear engineering school to work on board these nuclear submarines, to work on board these nuclear aircraft carriers? I've spoken to some of these nuclear engineers in the Navy. Who I've spoken to people in, in nuclear submarines. And again, we're talking about compartmentalization access to information restricted to those with a need to know. And, and they take it to extremes, folks. The people that oftentimes have the most need to know are the ones deprived of the intelligence because intelligence is very personal. It's egos and empires. It's, you know, my, myself, my agency, my bureau is more important than anyone else and we're, we're going to hoard our secrets. We're not going to pass it on to those who really need it. Robin Olds, in his memoirs, he was the great uh, jet fighter pilot. He was a double ace. He was a World War II ace. I mean, P-38 Lightnings. He and his wingman once attacked like 50 Messerschmitt ME-109s and, and, and Fock Wolf uh, uh, 190s. Just the two of them. Later on, he took over this battered and beaten up uh, tactical fighter wing in, in Thailand flying the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantoms in Vietnam. His memoir as a fighter pilot is an absolute classic, and he talks about 
the intelligence people would tell him, oh, there's the you know the SAM battery, surface-to-air missiles here, there, and everywhere. Uh, but he wasn't allowed to let his fighter pilots know where these were. And the reasoning was that if the fighter pilots were shot down and they were tortured, and they would give up the location of these SAM batteries. And, you know, Colonel Robin Old said, that's ridiculous. The North Vietnamese put those SAM batteries there. They know where they're at. They don't need to torture our pilots to find out where they put these missiles, right? Didn't matter, need to know. Uh, the, the fighter pilots who needed the information were deprived of it. That's how intelligence works. It's, intel it's, it's em egos and empires. Now that I'm on the subject, let me tell you about how this guy, the teller of tall NSA tales, oh, another of his whoppers is that he's uh, related to the royalty on the other side of his family, opposite Anu and the White Draco. Uh, on the Mantid side of his family, uh, he's royalty also. Okay, so royalty from the aliens, royalty from his satanic bloodline, his grandiosity, left, right, and center. So when all these unhealed people come to him for consults, this is what happens. Okay, yeah, I'm going to do a reading on you. You've got 90% reptilian in your background, and notice how he does this almost invariably. What he's doing is gaining the moral ascendancy. You're a reptilian. You're flawed. You're a reptilian. I'm the king reptilian, so you're automatically subordinate to me. And then he'll throw him a bone. Okay, you're, you know, you got a little bit of Lyran, you got a little bit of Andromedan, you got a little bit of Palladian, but you're mostly reptile. Oh, and by the way, you're from a satanic family too. You've been subjected to my control, and your father molested you when you're a little girl. And all of it is complete bullshit. All of it is complete nonsense, right? The person can come from a family where there was no abuse, no nothing, but you see what he's doing. Same thing that the dark intrusive thoughts do. When they compel someone to have these misgivings about people, oh, the dark thoughts, which they think is their own thoughts, don't talk to this person, don't talk to that person, isolate the person. The dark thoughts, intrusive entities, working through all these gossip mongers, oh, this person said this, this person said that, isolation, break up, drive wedges in between people, destroy relationships. And this is what this guy does in these, these, uh, these uh, Skype sessions. Oh, you know, you're mostly reptilian. Yeah, I know you think that you're mostly Palladian. You're a Palladian walking. No, you're a reptile. And you were abused as a young girl by your father, but you're traumatized. You don't remember it. So what he's doing is he's isolating her. He's making it seem as if the people that this woman, in our example, trusted all her life. He's separating psychologically her from them, and he's replacing himself as the daddy figure. And oh, by the way, we're twin flames. Yeah, we're twin flames. Yeah, you should know. And if he doesn't tell them they're twin flames, he'll say he'll he'll tell them enough so they come to that conclusion themselves. Oh, I did a, a Skype session with so and so, and I I think we're twin flames. He knows so much about my past lives. And when he tells people about their alien pedigree, oh yeah, you're ninety percent reptilian. You got a little bit of Lyran. You got a little bit of Palladian. You got a little bit of Arcturan. It reminds me of that Bugs Bunny episode, where this dog is trying to get Bugs Bunny to adopt him, and he's making the sales pitch to Bugs Bunny. I'm fifty percent uh, uh, German Shepherd. I'm fifty percent Poodle. I'm fifty percent Setter. Irish Setter. I'm 50% Labrador Retriever. Prove it. You don't look like a lab Labrador Retriever to me, Bugs Bunny says. Well, go find me a, a Labrador and I'll retrieve it. I'm 50% Bull Mastiff. I'm 50%... And you see the same thing, right? You're 90% you're Reptilian. You're 4% Lyran. You're 6% Palladian. You're 11% uh, Arcturian. Uh, you're 22% you're uh, from Antares. Uh, you're 40% uh, hollow Earth, uh, and on and on and on. And and the longer that woman, in our example, is doing these Skype sessions, she's in a fugue state, he's astrally, he's, he's energetically messing, messing with her kundalini, she's feeling weakness in her solar plexus area, which is her, her will, her volition center, in a fugue state, and she's just like an open door, all this stuff just flooding into her, all this nonsense, all this energetic uh, hoochie and then she comes away with it thinking that her father molested her, that she's from a satanic bloodline family, that she's been mind controlled, she's a my lab. All this in like a 30, 40 minute session. And oh, her father molested her. 
And then, and then what he does is he substitutes himself. He becomes a daddy figure to that woman. I am the only one you can trust. I'm higher in the pecking order than you are. My grandfather is the white Draco, Anu. And on my mother's side, uh, you know, the, the mantis side, I'm, I'm royalty too. And all these unhealed people buy into it because they want to live through that fantasy. Now, you see, it's all about disempowerment. One of the things about these frauds, it's all about disempowerment, folks. It's all about just weakening these people, these already damaged people, more and more. The ones he's attracted to, he will astrally rape them. The ones that he may not be attracted to, he'll keep them on side. He'll still tell them that, oh, you're a twin flame, you're a soulmate. But he may or may not molest them, astrally molest them, depending on what he wants out of them. If he can get her under his control, he may go ahead and molest her anyway, astrally, and do other things to her, especially you know, even in his physical, personal space. You know, the stories I've heard about this guy, just, just groping women and stuff. It's very Kevin Spacey of you, pal, right? And when people have confronted him at get-togethers and parties, you did this, you did that, he doesn't even try to deny it. He doesn't try to deny it. But the thing about it is, he will keep some women on side. These are the women that are going on to YouTube and saying, I can't believe all these terrible things that are being said about him. He's been so good to me, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, why don't you also tell us that you're his soulmate, or you're, you're his twin flame. Okay, don't leave that part out. And another thing also, which you know, is a red flag, if he's so highfalutin royalty, if his grandfather was a highfalutin Satanist who can tell American intelligence and the NSA, you're going to recruit my daughter. If on his grandfather's side, he's like Anu royalty, and his grandmother's or mother's side, he's, he's Mantis royalty, why does he still need donations? Why does he even charge for these sessions? Can he just say, oh, look, you know, Uncle Anu or Grandfather Anu, uh, come on, home slice, throw me a bone. Uh, give me the lotto numbers for the Powerball, why don't you? For next week's Powerball, I don't want to have to work anymore. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, hey, mom, uh, you know, my Mantis royal mom or, or the Satanists in my family that are very high up there in MI5 and MI6. Oh, because he's got all bases covered. Yeah, you know, give me a cushy job. Uh, l let me be like a, uh, give me a directorship in Goldman Sachs or something. Now throw me a bone. Why does he still need to ask for donations? Why does he need to charge for, for uh, the, these consults? And it's all about disempowerment. When I work with people, I'll tell them what they need to hear. I'm not going to sugarcoat things. But I'm very careful that I don't want to disempower the person, make the person feel poorly about themselves. What I do is I accentuate the positive. Look, you've already endured all this. They've thrown everything, including the kitchen sink at you, and you're still here. You're still standing. That tells me that, you know what? You're a force to be reckoned with. Keep working on, on, uh, on healing. Keep working on reintegration. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Instead of pulling the rug out from under him. Yeah, your father molested you. Yeah, you, you're... You know, to come right out and tell people they're in SRA families. To come right out and tell them they're my labs. When there's absolutely no proof of that. That is offensive to me. That is absolutely offensive. Sometimes when I'm, I'm working with somebody and I get the feeling that they've gone through a lot of harsh abuse, I have to work around that. I have to coach things in a certain way as not to trigger the person, not to instill an anxiety or a panic attack, not to make the person feel poorly about themselves. We never want to be the cause of someone else feeling poorly about themselves. It's, it's not right. It's not our right to do that, to cut the rug out from somebody, to pull... You know, the rug out from somebody that chopped them off at the knees. Anyone who's anyone in this field, your job is to uplift, empower, encourage, not, not make people feel poorly about themselves. Or, or, or question the nature of their upbringing. Oh, I, I, yeah, you know, I thought I had a really good, I, you know, relationship with my dad. I thought my family was really cool, you know, but it turns out they're all Satanists. Turns out I'm 99% reptile with, you know, a, you know, a little bit of Palladian, a little bit of Arcturan. All this coming from a guy whose stories are so demonstrably, provably false. And again, I, I'm repeating myself, but it speaks to the fact that the people that go to him have been pre-manipulated, pre-malignly influenced, probably have had stuff installed in them. 
uh, at a deep soul level. And then they go to this guy and they just buy into all the nonsense. And now, once again, he's playing the role of victim. Oh, you know, the, the, my clients are attacking me with their black magic. I'm the victim, victim aggressor mode. Now there's this other guy, like I said, you know. Oh, he, he's, he's done autopsies on 3,000 different aliens. 3,000 is a big number, folks. And, and, and I talked about the compartmentalization of how agencies just don't share information with other agencies. Like you look at the Holy Stone operations, the, the, uh, the first the diesel and then the nuclear submarine espionage missions, where they would take these American subs right into the, these like Soviet-controlled harbors where these naval bases, and then they'd intercept all this telemetry, intercept all this signals communication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, one of the most famous operations was Ivy Bells, where they would tap into uh, the underground cable of the of, of the Russian, the, the Soviet military, and they had this big phone booth-sized recording device inside of which they said property of the U.S. government, right? And they would. The submarine would install the thing, tap into the cables of the uh, Soviet military communications, leave it there, and sometime later another nuclear sub comes along and gets the recording device out of it, puts a new recording device out of it, sails away, and that's right underneath the nose of the Soviets, right? In a very hostile environment, places like the Barents Sea, other places like that. And do you... do you think that everyone on the crew knew what was going on? No. The crew had no need to know. The crew is there to do their job. They're not being told we're, we're going over here to, you know, tap Soviet military communications through one of their cables that happens to, you know, be underwater and we have access to it with our nuclear spy subs. They don't have a need to know that. The only ones who had a need to know were, were, were a very few number of people, including the Navy spooks that were on board specifically to do this work, and also the divers that were involved. It's not like the whole crew knew what was going on. And what naval intelligence would do is they give these recorders to NSA, okay, here, you know, uh, figure it out, then give us back the intel. And for a while, NSA did that. But you know what? After a while, NSA said, no, we're keeping these. It's our job to decrypt and analyze uh, Soviet communications, so we're keeping this. And NSA and Naval Intelligence had no, no choice but to go along with it. They, they'd conduct these hazardous missions, you know, get the recorders out of these big devices underwater, give it to NSA, and NSA didn't even give them any information back after a while. And, and to add insult to injury, it was an analyst at NSA, Ron Pelton, who was a walk-in to the Soviets and said, oh, I work for NSA, and by the way, we're tapping your cables, right? And when the Soviets went and they pulled this thing out of the water, opened it up, there was a big sign in it, property of U.S. government, right? So all those guys doing these hazardous, hazardous missions, not even most of them not even knowing what's going on and on board these nuclear subs, they were totally, you know, put at risk by Ron Pelton, NSA spy, right? And it's an example, NSA not giving information to naval intelligence, and that's how intelligence works. It's very personal. Egos and empires, we have secrets. We're feeling self-important. We're not going to share it with you. Even though you fighter pilots are flying over these SAM sites and getting shot down and wind up in the Hanoi Hilton, getting tortured morning, noon, and night, not our problem, Right? But because these people have no or little life experience, they keep going to these people, keep buying into this stuff, disempowering themselves in the process because they're not given given information that's going to help them. They're lied to. And then on top of that, some of them are, a lot of them are astrally raped. And he keeps just enough women on side and enough brainwashed men on side to defend him. Oh, he would never do that. I can't believe the things that you're saying. Well, maybe it's maybe, lady, it's because he never astrally raped you because you're not attractive to him. Okay? Did, did that ever occur to you? And that's how it works, folks. Okay, we've reached the end of this segment. We're going to have a members segment. I'm going to talk about other things. But I just wanted to dispel this whole crazy notion. Me mom brought home NSA documents because she was a German translator and, oh, uh, you know, an entire apparatus of the NSA, you know, didn't have a single qualified German translator. I'll leave you with this thought, okay? I have a background in communications and intelligence, and I'm a student of the intelligence world. It's what I do. 
And that's why the Divine Matrix has brought all these people to me over the years. People whose fathers were involved in satellites, spy satellites, people involved in uh, nuclear uh, uh, submarines, people involved in, in covert operations. I speak their language and I let them talk. And on top of that, my own studies of intelligence, counterintelligence, special, uh, special operations. And I look back to the old days, right? And, you know, if you can put them all together in the same room, all the former people with a demonstrably provable military and or intelligence background, going all the way back to the greats like Major Donald Kehoe, a former uh, Marine major who was exposing the Air Force for their cover-ups, exposing the CIA for their cover-ups. Uh, Todd Zeckel, former NSA uh, member who was uh, a key player in the early days of UFO research. Uh, people like C Colonel Wendell Stevens, former test pilot in the Air Technical Intelligence Center background, and he was involved in his own secret uh, photography uh, missions of UFOs in the Arctic Circle. Think of Bill Hamilton, think of Jorge Martin with all his, his uh, intelligence uh, connections, intelligence sources. I think of all these people from the, ba from the old days. Uh, Robert Dean, right? Some of you are familiar with his story. And uh, Elton Turner, former member of the Army Security Agency, NSA. I think of uh, the late Vance Davis, Vance Davis, one of the Augsburg Six, former member of INSCOM, Intelligence Security Command, also NSA. And others like them. Put them all in the same room, and I told them the story about me, mom, brought home NSA documents, and she was the only German translator available to read all this stuff about, right, crash flying saucers and the Germans and all this other stuff. I throw in Leonard Stringfield, the great Leonard Stringfield in there too. Put them all in the room, and I told them the story. You would hear the gales of laughter from here to the Andromeda uh, system and back. Because nobody in those days would have taken that, that stuff seriously. But you see, how many of those people are still around? Really, I, I mean, when you think about it, how many people could just even care anymore, right? But the, these, these people, these frauds, and there's so many of them, oh, you know, there's a big dome over the Earth, and we've never gotten you know, beyond low Earth orbit. Satellites don't exist. The Earth is flat. Nuclear weapons don't exist. It's all fear porn, uh, fear porn. They can get away with saying these things because they know most people are ignorant. See, I'm different. Well, when I hear something from someone ignorant about the subject, I'll say, what does that mean? I never, I never heard that term before. Could you tell me what that means? It makes me look smart when I ask somebody that. I've never heard that before. Could you elaborate? I don't just go, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Act like a big shot. When I have no idea what the person's talking about, Right, Because in the end, I have to answer to myself. I can't just blow smoke and act like I know everything when I'm ignorant about certain things, because that's bad. That's, that's like dark, intrusive thoughts creeping in. Yeah, Bartley, just nod your head and act like you know what you're talking about. Right? We have to have that internal barometer, that internal discernment meter, and the self-restraint to know where our knowledge ends and our ignorance begins. Okay. Anyhow, we've reached the end of this segment of the cosmic, uh, rather the Bartley's commentaries on the cosmic wars. And uh, you know, stay tuned for the member section. And for those of you listening, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com, sign up, and become a member. And we'll see the members at the top of the next segment. Bye for now. <laughs>